Hello, and welcome to Paper Cuts. Uh, last time we left off, we, uh, where were we? Uh, we were four chapters into Mary Shelley's The Last Man. Uh, the narrator was getting increasingly affectionate with this, uh, with the former lord of Windsor Castle. Uh, and, uh, for a little context, this is set in 2074, I believe. Uh, the king of Win the king of England, uh, Duke of Windsor, has abdicated his throne, and the queen is very unhappy about that. So he's trying to get the uh, the prince, who our narrator has been very affectionate with, uh, to you know re-obtain the throne. So that's fun. Uh, <laughs> I gotta say. I know this is just, like, mildly affectionate in Victorian term, you know, or, or whenever this was appropriately written. Uh, this is supposed to be written as mildly affectionate. It, it reads as very much dialogue between two lovers, <laughs> or at least a one-sided love affair. Uh, I guess it would be more of a one-sided love affair, given, you know, the rest of the, uh, rest of the context. Uh, but anyway, I am struggling to not read this as romantic uh, with my modern eyes and uh, we'll continue to read uh, with chapter four the next day lord raymond called at perdita's cottage on his way to windsor castle my sister's heightened color and sparkling eyes half revealed her secret to me he was perfectly self-possessed he accosted us both with courtesy seemed immediately to enter into our feelings and to make one with us i scanned his phys physiognomy which varied as he spoke, yet was beautiful in every change. The usual expression of his eyes was soft, though at times you could make them even glare with ferocity. His complexion was colorless, and every trait spoke predominant self-will. His smile was pleasing, though disdain too often curled his lips, lips which to female eyes were the very throne of beauty and love. His voice, usually gentle, often startled you by its sharp, discordant note, which showed that his usual low tone was rather the work of study than nature. Thus full of contradictions, unbending yet haughty, gentle yet fierce, tender and again neglectful, he by some strange art found easy entrance to the admiration and affection of women, now caressing and tyrannizing over them according to his mood, but in every charge, a despot, in every change, a despot. At the present time, Raymond evidently wished to appear amiable. Wit, hilarity, and deep observation were mingled in his talk rendering every sentence that he uttered as a flash of light. He soon conquered my latent distaste. I endeavored to watch him in Perdita, and to keep in mind everything I had heard to his disadvantage. But it all, felt so, it all felt so disingenuous. Uh, oh, it all appeared, rather. It all appeared so in ingenuous, and all was so fascinating, that I forgot everything except the pleasure his society offered me. Under the idea of initiating me in the scene of English politics and society, of which I was soon to become a part, he narrated a number of anecdotes and sketched many characters. His discourse, rich and varied, flowed on, pervading all my senses with pleasure. But for one thing he would have been completely triumphant. He alluded to Adrian and spoke of him with the disparagement that the worldly wise always attached to enthusiasm. He perceived the cloud gathering and tried to dissipate it, but the strength of my feelings would not permit me to pass thus lightly over this sacred subject, and so I said emphatically, Permit me to remark that I am devotedly attached to the Earl of Windsor. He is my best friend and benefactor. I reverence his goodness, I accord with his opinions, I and bitterly lament his present, and I trust, temporary illness. That illness, from which its pure peculiarity, makes it painful to me beyond words to hear him mentioned unless in terms of respect and affection. Raymond replied, but there was nothing conciliatory in his reply. I saw that in his heart he despised those dedicated to any but worldly idols. Every man, he said, dreams about something, love, honor, and pleasure. You dream of friendship and devote yourself to a maniac. Well, if that be your vocation, doubtless you are in the right to follow it. Some reflection seemed to sting him, and the spasm of pain that for a moment convulsed his countenance checked my indignation. Happy are dreamers, he continued, so that they be not awakened. Would that I could dream. But broad and garish day is the element in which I live. 
the dazzling glare of reality inverts the scene for me. Even the ghost of friendship has departed, and love... He broke off, nor could I guess whether the disdain that curled his lip was directed against the passion or against himself for being its slave. This account may be taken as a sample of my intercourse with Lord Raymond. I became intimate with him, and each day afforded me occasion to admire more and more his powerful and versatile talents, that together with his eloquence, which was graceful and witty, and his wealth, now immense, caused him to be feared, loved, and hated beyond any other man in England. My descent, which claimed interest, if not respect, my former connection with Adrian, the favor of the ambassador, whose secretary I had been, and now my intimacy with Lord Raymond gave me easy access to the fashionable and political circles of England. To my inexperience, we had first appeared on the eve of a civil war. Each party was violent, acrimonious, and unyielding. Parliament was divided by three factions, aristocrats, democrats, and royalists. After Adrian's declared predilection to the re republican form of government, the latter party had nearly died away, chiefless, guideless. But when Lord Raymond came forward as its leader, it revived with redoubled force. Some were royalists from prejudice and ancient affection, and there were many moderately inclined who feared alike the capricious tyranny of the popular party and the unbending despotism of the aristocrats. More than a third of the members ranged themselves under Raymond, and their number was perpetually increasing. The aristocrats built their hopes on preponderant wealth and influence. The reformers on the force of the nation itself. The debates were violent, more violent, the discourses held by each knot of politicians as they assembled to arrange their measures. Opprobrious epithets were bandied about, resistance even to the death threatened. Meetings of the populace disturbed the quiet order of the country. Except in war, how could all this end? Even as the destructive flames were ready to break forth... Oh, you'll have to excuse me. Uh, ready to break forth, I saw them shrink back, allayed by the absence of the military, by the aversion entertained by everyone to any violence, save that of speech and by the cordial politeness and even friendship of the hostile leaders when they met in private society. I was from a thousand motives induced to attend minutely to the course of events and watch each turn with intense anxiety. I could not but perceive that Perdita loved Raymond. We thought that he also regarded the fair daughter of Verney with admiration and tenderness. And yet I knew that he was urging to forward his marriage with the presumptive heiress of the earldom of Windsor, with keen expectation of the advantages that would thence accrue to him. All the ex-queen's friends were his friends. Oh. You will have to excuse my yawns. Oh, I've been eating a lot because it's, you know, Thanksgiving and then Black Friday, which is the best time to eat Thanksgiving leftovers, so I'm a little sleepy. Uh, where was I? Ex-queen's friends were his friends. No week passed that he did not hold consultations with her at Windsor. My captions died. I think my captions cannot hear me very well. Hello, captions? Are you alive? Yes, caption that source when it's heard on stream. For that, profanity filter off, just in case. So... Are my captions working? Hello, captions? Hello, captions? Ugh, really? The captions have decided to stop working. That's very rude of them. Captioning is enabled. <laughs> there it goes. It was just taking its sweet time. Maybe I just need to scooch up. Excuse me, my phone is a bit low on battery, so I need to fix it. Uh, okay, yeah, that's where we were. 
I had never seen the sister of Adrian. I heard that she was lovely, amicable, and fascinating. Wherefore should I see her? There are times when we, ha when we have an indefinable sentiment of impending change, for better or for worse. To arise from an event, and be it for better or for worse, we fear the change and shun the event. For this reason I avoided this high-born damsel. To me she was everything and nothing. Her very name, mentioned by another, made me start and tremble. The endless discussion concerning her union with Lord Raymond was real agony to me. Methought that Adrian, withdrawn from active life in this beauteous Idris, a victim probably to her mother's ambitious schemes, I ought to come forward to protect her from undue influence, guard her from unhappiness, and secure her to her freedom of her choice, the right of every human being. And yet how was I to do this? She herself would disdain my interference. Since then, I must be an object of indifference or contempt to her, better, far better, to avoid her, nor expose myself before her in the scornful world to the chance of playing the mad game of a fond, foolish Icarus. One day, several months after my return to England, I quitted London to visit my sister. Her society was my chief solace and delight, and my spirits always rose at the expectation of seeing her. Her conversation was full of pointed remark and discernment. In her pleasant, uh, in her pleasant alcove, redolent with the sweetest flowers, adorned by magnificent casts, antique vases, and copies of the finest pictures of Raphael, Correggio, and Claude, painted by herself, I fancied myself in a fairy retreat, untainted by and inaccessible to the noisy contentions of politicians and the frivolous pursuits of fashion. On this occasion, my sister was not alone nor could I fail to recognize her companion. It was Idris, the till now unseen object of my mad idolatry. Just one moment, I'm going to grab some water. In what fitting terms of wonder and delight, in what choice expression and soft flow of language can I usher in the loveliest, the wisest, the best? How, in poor assemblage of words, convey the halo of glory that surrounded her, the thousand graces that waited unwearied on her? The first thing that struck you on beholding that charming countenance was its perfect goodness and frankness. Candor sat upon her brow, simplicity in her eyes, heavenly benignity in her smile. Her tall, slim figure bent gracefully as a poplar to the breezy west, and her gait, goddess-like, was that of a winged an was as that of a winged angel, new alit from heaven's high floor. The pearly fairness of her complexion was stained by a pure suffusion. Her voice resembled the low, subdued tenor of a flute. It is perhaps easiest to describe by contrast. I have detailed the perfections of my sister, and yet she was utterly unlike Idris. Perdita, even where she loved, was reserved and timid. Idris was frank and confiding. The one recoiled to solitude that she might there entrench herself from disappointment and injury. The other walked forth in open day, believing that none would harm her. Wordsworth has compared a beloved female to two fair objects in nature, but his lines always appeared to me rather a contrast than a similitude. A violet by the mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, far fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. Such a violet was sweet Perdita, trembling to entrust herself to the very air, cowering from observation, and yet betrayed by her excellences, and repaying with a thousand graces the labor of those who sought her in her lonely bypath. Idris was as the star, set in single splendor the dim, an anodem of balmy evening. Ready to enlighten and delight the subject world, shielded herself from every taint by her unimagined distance from all that was not like herself akin to heaven.
I found this vision of beauty in Perdita's alcove in earnest conversation with its inmate. When my sister saw me, she rose and, taking my hand, said, He is here, even at our wish. This is Lionel, my brother. Idris rose also and bent on me her eyes of celestial blue, and with grace peculiar said, You hardly need an introduction. We have a picture highly valued by my father, which declares at once your name. Verney, you will acknowledge this tie, and as my brother's friend I feel that I may trust you. And then Lids, humid, with a tear and trembling voice, she continued, Dear friends, do not think it strange that now, visiting you for the first time, I ask your assistance, and confide my wishes and fears to you. To you alone do I dare speak. I have heard you commended by impartial spectators. You are my brother's, you are my brother's friends, therefore you must be mine. What can I say? If you refuse to aid me, I am lost indeed. She cast up her eyes while wonder held her auditors mute. Then, as if carried away by her feelings, she cried, My brother, beloved ill-fated Adrian, how speak your misfortunes? Doubtless you have both heard the current tale, perhaps believe the slander. But he's not mad. Were an angel from the foot of God's throne to assert it, never, never would I believe any of it. He is wronged, betrayed, imprisoned. Imprisoned. Save him. Verney, you must do this. Seek him out in whatever part of the island is immured. Find him, rescue him from his persecutors, restore him to himself, to me. On the wide earth I have none to love but only him. Sorry. I keep getting messages that I need to take care of. Oh, so busy tonight. Dear podcast listeners uh, are in a little bit better of a spot this evening. They will have all these awkward silences between paragraphs cut out. Her earnest appeal, so sweetly and passionately expressed, filled me with wonder and sympathy. And when she added, with thrilling voice and look, Do you consent to undertake this enterprise? I vowed with energy and truth, to devote myself in life and death to the restoration and welfare of Adrian. We then conversed on the plan I should pursue, and discussed the probable means of discovering his residence. While we were in earnest discourse, Lord Raymond entered unannounced. I saw Perdita tremble and glow deadly pale, and the cheeks of Idris glow with purest blushes. He must have been astonished at our conclave, disturbed by it, I should have thought, but nothing of this appeared. He saluted my companions and addressed me with a cordial greeting. Idris appeared suspended for a moment, and then with extreme sweetness she said, Lord Raymond, I confide in your goodness and honor. Smiling haughtily, he bent his head and replied, with emphasis, Do you, do you indeed confide, Lady Idris? She endeavored to read his thought and then answered with dignity, As you please. It is certainly best not to compromise oneself by any concealment. Pardon me if I have offended. Whether you trust me or not, rely on my doing my utmost to further your wishes, whatever they may be. Idris smiled her thanks and rose to take leave. Lord Raymond requested permission to accompany her to Windsor Castle, to which she consented, and they quitted the cottage together. My sister and I were left, truly like two fools who fancied they'd obtained a golden treasure, till daylight showed it to be lead. Too silly, luckless flies who had played in sunbeams and were caught in a spider's web. I, I leaned against the casement and watched those two glorious creatures till they disappeared in the forest glades, and then I turned. Perdita had not moved, her eyes fixed on the ground, her cheeks pale, her very lips white, motionless and rigid, her every feature stamped by woe. She, sta she sat. Half frightened, I would have taken her hand, but she shudderingly withdrew it, and strove to collect herself. I entreated her to speak to me.
Okay. Uh, where was I? B -b -b not now, nor do you speak to me, my dear Lionel. You can say nothing, for you know nothing. I will see you tomorrow. In the meantime, adieu. She rose and walked from the room, but pausing at the door and leaning against it, as if her over-busy thoughts had taken from her the power of supporting herself, she said, Lord Raymond will probably return. Will you tell him that he must excuse me today, for I am not well? I will see him tomorrow, if he wishes it, and you also. You had better return to London with him. You can there make the enquiries agreed upon concerning the Earl of Windsor, and visit me again tomorrow, before you proceed on your journey. Until then, farewell. She spoke falteringly, and concluded with a heavy sigh. I gave my assent to her request, and she left me. I felt as if, from the order of the systematic world, I had plunged into chaos, obscure, contrary, unintelligible. That Raymond should marry Idris was more than ever intolerable, and yet my passion, though a giant from its birth, was too strange, wild, and impracticable for me to feel at once the misery I perceived in, perce perceived in Perdita. How should I act? She had not confided in me. I could not demand an explanation from Raymond without the hazard of betraying what was perhaps her most treasured secret. I would obtain the truth from her the following day, in the meantime. But while I was occupied by multiplying reflections, Lord Raymond returned. He asked for my sister, and I delivered her mes and I delivered her message. After musing on it for a moment, he asked me if I were about to return to London, and if I would accompany him. To this I consented. He was full of thought and remained silent during a considerable part of our ride. At length he said, "I must apologize to you for my abstraction." The truth is, Ryland's motion comes on tonight, and I am considering my reply. Ryland was the leader of the popular party, a hard-headed man and in his way elegant. He had obtained leave to bring in a bill, making it treason to endeavor to change the present state of the English government and the standing laws of the Republic. This attack was directed against Raymond and his machinations for the restoration of the monarchy. Raymond asked me if I would accompany him to the house that evening. I remembered my pursuit for intelligence concerning Adrian, and knowing that my time would be fully occupied, I excused myself. Nay, I can free you from your... Oh, I paused to not yawn in the middle of the sentence, gosh darn it. Nay, I can free you from your pe present impediment. You're going to make enquiries concerning the Earl of Windsor. I can answer them at once. He's the Duke of Athol's seat in Dunkeld. On the first approach of his disorder, he traveled about from one place to another until, arriving in that romantic seclusion, he refused to quit it, and we made arrangements with the Duke for his continuing there. I was hurt by the careless tone with which he conveyed this information and replied coldly, I am obliged to you for your intelligence and will avail myself of it. You shall, Verney, and if you continue of the same, same mind, I will facilitate your views. But first witness, I beseech you, the result of this night's contest and the triumph I'm about to achieve, if I may so call it, while I fear that victory is to me defeat. What can I do? My dearest hopes appear to be near their fulfillment. The ex-queen gives me Idris. Adrian is totally unfitted to be succeed to the earldom, and that earldom in my hands becomes a kingdom once more. By the reigning guard, it is true, the paltry earldom of Windsor shall no longer content him, who will inherit the rights which must forever pertain to the person who possesses it. The countess can never forget that she's been a queen, and she disdains to leave a dis diminished inheritance to her children. Her power and my wit will rebuild the throne, and this brow will be clasped by a kingly diadem. I can do this. I can marry Idris. He stopped abruptly, his countenance, cha his countenance darkened, and its expression changed again and again, un under the influence of internal passion. I asked, Does, does Lady Is Idris love you? What a question! <laughs> she will, of course, as I shall her when we are married. You begin late. Marriage is usually considered the grave and not the cradle of love. 
so you are about to love her, but do not already. Do not catechize, catechize me. Catechism, catechize? Catechize. Do not catechize me, Lionel. I will do my duty by her, be assured. Love, I steel my heart against that, expel it from its tower of strength, barricade it out. The fountain of love must cease to play, its waters be dried up, and all passionate thoughts attendant on it die. That is to say, the love which would rule me, not that which I rule. Idris is a gentle, pretty, sweet little girl. It is impossible to not have an affection for her, and I have a very sincere one. Only do not speak of love. Love, the tyrant and tyrant queller. Love, until now my conqueror, now my slave. The hungry fire, the untamable beast, the fanged snake. No, no, I will have nothing to do with that love. Tell me, Lionel, do you consent that I should marry this young lady? He bent his keen eyes upon me, and my uncontrollable heart swelled in my bosom. I replied in a calm voice, but how far from calm was the thought imaged by my still words. Never. I can never consent that Lady Idris should be united to one who does not love her. Because you love her yourself. Your lordship might have spared that taunt. I do not dare, dare not love her. At least, he continued haughtily, she does not love you. I would not marry a reigning sovereign were I not sure that her heart was free. But, oh, Lionel, a kingdom is a word of might, and gently sounding are the terms that compose the style of royalty. Were not the mightiest men of the olden times kings? Alexander was a king. Solomon, the wisest of men, was a king. Napoleon was a king. Caesar died in his attempt to become one, and Cromwell, the Puritan and king-killer, aspired to regality. The father of Adrian yielded up the already broken scepter of England, but I will rear the fallen plant, join its dismembered frame, and exalt it above all the flowers of the field. You need not wonder that I freely discover Adrian's abode. Do not suppose that I am wicked or foolish enough to found my proposed sovereignty on a fraud, and one so easily as discovered from the truth or falsehood of an earl's insanity. I am just come from him. Before I decided on my marriage with Idris, I resolved to see him myself again, and to judge of the probability of his recovery. He is... Irrecover irrecoverably mad. I gasp for breath. I will not detail to you the melancholy particulars. You shall see him and judge for yourself. Although I fear this visit, useless to him, will be insufferably painful to you. It has weighed on my spirits ever since. Excellent and gentle as he, is, as he is, even in the downfall of his reason, I do not worship him as you do, but I would give all my hopes of a crown in my right hand to boot, to see him restored to himself. His voice expressed the deepest compassion. Thou most, thou most accountable, unaccountable being, whither will I actions tend, in all this maze of purpose in which thou seemest lost? Whither indeed? To a crown, a golden begemmed crown, I hope, and yet I dare not trust, and though I dream of a crown and wake for one, ever and anon a busy devil whispers to me that it is but a fool's cap I seek, and that were I wise I should trample on it and take in its stead that which is worth all the crowns of the East and the presidentships of the West. And what is that? If I do make it my choice, then you shall know. At present I dare not speak. Even think of it. Again he was silent, and after a pause, he turned to me laughingly. When scorn did not inspire his, wor his mirth, it was genuine gaiety that painted his features with a joyous expression. His beauty became supereminent, divine. Verney, my first act when I become king of England will be to unite with the Greeks, Take Constantinople and subdue all Asia. I intend to be a warrior, a conqueror. Napoleon's name shall veil to mine, and enthusiasts, instead of visiting his rocky grave and exalting the merits of the fallen, shall adore my majesty and magnify my illustrious achievements. 
I listened to Raymond with intense interest. Could I be other than all ear to one who seemed to govern the whole earth in his grasping imagination? And who only quailed when he attempted to rule himself? Then on his word and will dis then on his word and will depended my own happiness, the fate of all dear to me. I endeavoured to divine the concealed mining, meaning of his words. Perdita's name was not mentioned, and yet I could not doubt that love for her called the vacillation of purpose that he exhibited. And who was so worthy of love as my noble-minded sister? Who deserved the hand of this self-exalted king more than she whose glance belonged to a queen of nations? Who loved him as he did her? Notwithstanding that disappointment quelled her passion, and ambition held strong combat with his. We went together to the house in the evening. Raymond, while he knew that his plans and prospects were to be discussed and decided during the expected debate, was gay and careless. Anne Hum, like that of ten thousand hives of swarming bees, stunned us as we entered the coffee room. Knots of politicians were assembled with anxious brows and loud or deep voices. Their, the aristocratical party, the richest and most influential men in England, appeared less agitated than the others, for the question was to be discussed without their interference. Near the fire was Ryland and his supporters. Ryland was a man of obscure birth and of immense wealth, inherited from his father who had been a manufacturer. He had witnessed, when a young man, the abdication of the king and the amalgamation of the two houses of lords and commons. He had sympathized with these popular encroachments, and it had been the business of his life to... Oh, I keep stopping to try and not yawn in the middle of my sentence, and then I yawn several moments later instead. Give me a moment, I'm going to have some water. I'm hoping that if I drink enough water, my body will be tricked out of needing to yawn. Where was I? Uh, first, Ryland was not... Uh, consolidated and increased them. Since then, the influence of the landed proprietors had augmented, and at first Ryland was not sorry to observe the machinations of Lord Raymond, which drew off many of his op opponent's partisans. But the thing was now going too far. The poorer nobility hailed the return of sovereignty, as an event which would restore them to their power and rights that were now lost. The half-extinct spirit of royalty roused itself in the minds of men, and they, willing slaves, self-constituted subjects, were willing to bend their necks to the yoke. Some erect and manly spirits still remained, pillars of state, but the word republic had grown stale to the vulgar ear, and many, the event would prove whether it was a majority, pined for the tinsel and show of royalty. Ryland was roused to resistance. He asserted that his sufferance alone had permitted the increase of the party, but for the time it, that his indulgence was passed, and with one motion of his arm, he would sweep away the cobwebs that blinded his countrymen. When Raymond entered the coffee room, his presence was hailed by his friends with almost a shout. They gathered round him, counted their numbers, and detailed the reasons why they were now to receive an addition of such and such members who had not yet declared themselves. Some trifling business of the house having been gone through, the leaders took their seats in the chamber. The clamor of voices continued till the Ryland rose to speak, and then the slightest whispered observation was audible. All eyes were fixed upon him as he stood, ponderous of frame, sonorous of voice, and with a manner which, though not graceful, was impressive. I turned from his marked iron countenance to Raymond, whose face, veiled by a smile, would not betray his care, and yet his lips quivered somewhat, and his hand clasped the bench on which he sat with a convulsive strength that made the muscles start again. Ryland began by praising this present state of the British Empire. He recalled past years to their memory, 
the miserable contentions of which in the time of our fathers arose almost a civil war, the abdication of the late king, and the foundation of the republic. He described this republic, showed how it gave privilege to each individual in the state to rise to consequence and even to temporary sovereignty. He compared the royal and republican spirit, showed how the one tended to enslave the minds of men, while all the institutions of the other served to raise even the meanest among us to something great and good. He showed how England had become powerful, and its inhabitants valiant and wise, by means of the freedom they enjoyed. As he spoke, every heart swelled with pride, and every cheek glowed with delight, to remember that each one there was English, and that each supported and contributed to the happy state of things now commemorated. Ryan's fervor increased. His eyes lighted up. His voice assumed the tone of passion. There was one man, he continued, who wished to alter all this, and bring us back to our days of impotence and contention. One man who would dare arrogate the honor which was due to all who claimed England as their birthplace, and set his name and style above the name and style of his country. I saw at this juncture that Raymond changed color. His eyes were withdrawn from the orator and cast on the ground. The listeners turned from one to the other, but in the meantime the speaker's voice filled their ears. The thunder of his denunciations influenced their senses. The very boldness of his language gave him weight. Each knew that he spoke truth, a truth known but not acknowledged. He tore from reality the mask which, which she, with which she had been clothed, and the purposes of Raymond, which had before had crept around and snaring by stealth, now stood a hunted stag, even at bay, as all perceived who watched the irrepressible change of his, changes of his countenance. Ryland ended by moving that any attempt to re-erect the kingly power should be declared treason, and he a traitor who should endeavor to change the present form of government. Cheers and loud acclamations followed the close of his speech. After his motion had been seconded, Lord Raymond rose, his countenance bland, his voice softly melodious, his manner soothing, and his grace and sweetness came like the mild breathing of a flute after the loud organ-like voice of his adversary. He rose, he said, to speak in favor of the honorable member's motion with one slight amendment subjoined. He was ready to go back to old times and can commemorate the contests of our fathers and the monarch's abdication. Nobly and sweetly, he said, had the illustrious and last sovereign of England sacrificed himself to the apparent good of his country, and divested himself of a power which could only be maintained by the blood of his subjects. These subjects named so no more, these his friends and equals had in gratitude conferred certain favors and distinctions on him and his family forever. An ample estate was allotted to them, and they took the first rank among the peers of Great Britain. And yet, it might be conjectured that they had not forgotten their ancient heritage. And it was hard that his heir should suffer alike with any other pretender if he attempted to regain what by ancient right and inheritance belonged to him. He did not say that he should favor such an attempt, but he did say that such an attempt would be venial. And if the aspirant did not go so far as to declare war and erect a standard in the kingdom, his fault ought to be regarded with an indulgent eye. In, his amend in, in the amendment he proposed, an exception would be made in the bill in favor of any person who, cr who claimed the sovereign power of the right of the Earls of Windsor. Nor did Raymond make an end without drawing in vivid and glowing colors the, splendid of a ki the splendor of a kingdom in opposition to the commercial spirit of republicanism. He asserted that each individual under the English monarchy was then, as now, capable of, attain of attaining high rank and power, higher and nobler, nobler a rank than a bartering, timorous commonwealth could afford. And for this exception, who, to what did it amount? The nature of riches and influence enforcibly confined the list of candidates to a few of the wealthiest, and it was to be feared that the ill-humor and contention generated The ill humor and contention generated by this triennial struggle would counterbalance its advantages in impartial eyes. I can ill record the flow of language and graceful terms of expression, the wit and easy raillery that gave vigor and influence to his speech. His manner, timid at first, became firm, his changeful face was lit up to superhuman brilliancy, his voice, various as music, was like that enchanting. 
It was useless to record the debate that followed this harangue. Party speeches were delivered, which clothed the question in Kant and veiled its simple meaning in a woven wind of words. The motion was lost. Ryland withdrew in a rage and despair, and Raymond, gay and exulting, retired to dream of his future kingdom. Okay, before we dive into chapter 5, I'm going to grab another little drink of water. I'm going to mute my mic in the process. Well, I know who we're raiding after the stream. Uh, Loriana has gone live, so if she's still live by the time I'm done here, uh, we'll go give her. We'll go give her a wave. Let's dive into chapter five, which is on the page here, mislabeled as chapter four again. That's not confusing at all. <laughs> is there such a feeling as love at first sight? And if there be, in what does its nature differ from love founded in long observation and slow growth? Perhaps its effects are not so permanent, but while they, but they are, while they last, as violent and intense. We walk the pathless mazes of society, vacant of joy, till we hold this clue, leading us through that labyrinth to paradise. Our nature, dim, like an unlighted torch, sleeps in formless blank till the fire attain it. And this, this life of life, this light to moon and glory to the sun, what does it matter whether the fire be f struck from flint and steel, nourished with care into a flame slowly communicated to the dark wick, or whether swiftly the radiant power of light and warmth passes from a kindred power and shines at once the beacon and the hope. In the deepest fountain of my heart the pulses were stirred, around, above, beneath the clinging memory as a cloak enwrapped me. In no one moment of coming time did I feel as I had done in time gone by, the spirit of Idris hovered in the air I breathed. Her eyes were ever and forever bent on mine. Her remembered smile blinded my faint gaze, and caused me to walk as one, not in eclipse, not in darkness and vacancy, but in a new and brilliant light, too novel, too dazzling for my human senses. On every leaf, on every small division of the universe, as on the high, as on the highest, as on the hyacinth, a C is engraved, engraved was imprinted the talisman of my existence. She lives. She is. I had not yet time to analyze my feeling, to take myself to task and leash in the tameless passion. All was one idea, one feeling, one knowledge. It was my life. But the die was cast. Raymond would marry Idris. The merry marriage bells rung in my ears. I heard the nation's gratulation which followed the union. The ambitious noble uprose with swift eagle flight from the lowly ground to regal supremacy and to the love of Idris. And yet not so. She did not love him. She had called me her friend. She had smiled on me. To me she had entrusted her heart's dearest hope, the welfare of Adrian. This reflection thawed my congealing blood, and again the tide of life and love flowed impetuously onward, again to ebb as my busy thoughts changed. The debate had ended at three in the morning. My soul was in tumults. I traversed the streets with eager rapidity. Truly I was mad that night. Love, which I have named a giant from its birth, wrestled with despair. 
my heart to the field of combat, was wounded by the iron heel of the one, watered by the gushing tears of the other. Day hateful to me dawned. I returned to my lodgings, I threw myself on a couch, I slept. Was it sleep, for, I th for the thought was still alive? Love and despair struggled still, and I writhed with unendurable pain. I awoke, I awoke half-stupefied. I felt a heavy oppression on me, but knew not wherefore. I entered, as it were, the council chamber of my brain, and questioned the various ministers of thought therein assembled. Too soon I remembered all. Too soon my lips quivered beneath the tormenting power. Soon, too soon, I knew myself a slave. Suddenly, unannounced, Lord Raymond entered my apartment. He came in gaily, singing the Tyrolese song of liberty noticed me with a gracious nod, and threw himself on a sofa, opposite the copy of a bust of the Apollo Belvedere. After one or two trivial remarks, to which I solemnly replied, he suddenly cried, looking at the bust, I am called like that victor. Not a bad idea. The head will serve for my new coinage, and be an omen to all dutiful subjects of my future success. He said this in his most gay, benevolent, yet benevolent manner, and smiled, not disdainfully, but in playful mockery of himself. Then his countenance suddenly darkened, and in that shrill tone peculiar to himself, he cried, I fought a good battle last night. Higher conquest the plains of Greece never saw me achieve. Now I am the first man in the state, burthen of every ballad, an object of every old woman's mumbled devotions. What are your meditations? You who fancy you can read the human soul as your native lake reads each crevice and folding of surrounding hills. Say what you think of me, king, expect an angel, angel or devil, witch. This ironical tone was discord to my bursting, overboiling heart. I was nettled by his insolence, and replied with bitterness, There is a spirit, neither angel nor devil, damned to limbo merely. I saw his cheeks become pale, and his lips whiten and quiver. His anger served but to enkindle mine, and I answered with a determined look his eyes which glared on me. Suddenly they were withdrawn cast down a tear, I thought, and wetted the dark lashes. I was softened, and with an involuntary emotion added, Not that you are such, my dear lord. I, pa I paused, even by the agitation he evinced. Yes, he said at length, rising and biting his lip, as he strove to curb his passion. Such am I. You do not know me, Verney, neither you nor audience of last night, nor does universal Eng England know an aught of me. I stand here, it would seem, an elected king. His hand is about to grasp a scepter. These brows feel in each nerve the coming diadem. I appear to have strength, power, victory, standing as a dome supporting column stands, and I am a reed. I have ambition that attains its aim. My nightly dreams are realized, my waking hopes fulfilled. A kingdom awaits my acceptance. My enemies are overthrown, but here, and he struck his heart with violence, here is the rebel, here the stumbling block, this overruling heart, which I may drain of its living blood, but while one fluttering pulsation remains, I am its slave. He spoke with a broken voice, and then bowed his head, and, hiding his face in his hands, wept. I was still smarting for my own disappointment, and yet this scene oppressed me even to terror, nor could I interrupt his excess of passion. It subsided at length, and throwing himself on the couch, he remained silent and motionless, except that his changeful features sh showed a strong internal conflict. At last he rose and said in his usual tone of voice, The time grows on us, Fernie. I must away. Let me not forget my chiefest errand here. Will you accompany me to Windsor tomorrow? You will not be dishonored by my society, and as this is probably the last service or disservice you can do me, will you grant my request? He held out his hand with an almost bashful air. Swiftly I thought, yes, I'll witness the last scene of the drama, beside which his men conquered me, and an affectionate sentiment toward him again filled my heart. I bade him command Aye, that I will. That's my cue now. Be with me tomorrow morning by seven. Be secret and faithful, and you shall be groom of the stole ere long. So saying, he hastened away, 
vaulted on his horse, and with a gesture as if he gave me his hand to kiss, bade me another laughing adieu. Left to myself, I strove with painful intensity to divine the motive of his request and foresee the events of the coming day. The hours passed on unperceived. My head arced with thought. The nerves seemed teeming with the overfull fraught. I clasped my burning brow as if my fevered hand could medicine its pain. I was, punctu I was punctual to the appointed hour on the following day, and found Lord Raymond waiting for me. We got into his carriage and proceeded toward Windsor. I had tutored myself, and was resolved by no outward sign to disclose my initial agitation. What a mistake, what a mistake Ryland made, when he thought to overpower me the other night. He spoke well, very well. Such a harangue would have succeeded better addressed to me singly, than to the fools and knaves assembled yonder. Had I been alone, I should have listened to him with a wish to hear reason, but when he endeavoured to vanquish me in my own territory with my own weapons, he put me on my mettle, and the event was such as all might have expected. I smiled incredulously, and replied, I am of Ryland's way of thinking, and will, if you please, repeat all his arguments. We shall see how far you'll be induced by them to change the royal for patriotic style. The repetition would be useless, since I remember them, and have many others self-suggested with speak, which speak with unanswerable persuasion. He did not explain himself, nor did I make any remark on his, plot, on his reply. Our silence endured for some miles, till the country with open fields or shady woods and parks presented pleasant objects to our view. After observation on the scenery and seats, Raymond said, Philosophers have called man a microcosm of nature, and find a reflection in the internal mind for all this machinery visibly at work behind us. This theory has often been a source of ent entertainment and amusement to me, and many an idle hour I've spent exercising my ingenuity in finding resemblances. Does not Lord Bacon say that the falling from a discord to a concord, that which maketh, maketh great sweetness in music, hath an agreement with the affections which are reintegrated to the better after some dislikes? What a sea is the tide of passion, whose fountains are in, our, are in our own nature. Our virtues are the quicksands, which show themselves at calm and low water, but let the waves arise, and the winds buffet them, and the poor devil whose hope was in their durability finds them sink out from under him. The fashions of the world, its exigencies, educations and pursuits, our winds to drive our wills like clouds all one way. But let a thunderstorm arrive in the shape of love or ambition, and the rack goes backward, stemming the opposite air in triumph. Yes, nature always presents to our eyes the appearance of a patient. While there is an active principle in man, which is capable of ruling fortune, and at least of tacking against the gale, till in some mode conquers it. There is more of what is specious to me than in your discretion. Did we form ourselves, choosing our dispositions and our power? I find myself, for one, as a stringed instrument with chords and stops, but I have no power to turn the page, or pitched my thoughts to a higher or lower key. Other men, I observed, may be better musicians. I talk not of others, but of myself, and I am fair as an example to go by as another. I cannot set my heart a particular tune, nor involuntary changes on my will. We are born. We chose neither our parents nor our station. We are educated by others, others or by the world's circumstances. And at this cultivation, mingling with our innate disposition, is the soil in which our desires, passions, and motives grow. There is truth in what you say, and yet no man ever acts upon this theory. Who, when he makes a choice, says, Thus I choose because I am necessitated? Does he not, which on the contrary, feel the freedom of will within him, which, 
though you may call it fallacious, still, still actuates him as he decides. Exactly so, another link of the breakless chain. Were I now to commit an act which would... Uh, oh, excuse me. Were I now to commit an act which would annihilate my hopes and pluck the regal garment from my mortal limbs to clothe them in ordinary weeds, would this, think you, be an act of free will on my part? As we talked thus, I perceived that we were not going the ordinary road to Windsor, but through Eaglefield, Englefield Green toward Bishopgate Hill. Or Bishop, Bishopgate Heath, rather. I began to divine that Idris was not the subject of our journey, but I was brought to witness the scene that was dis to decide the fate of Raymond and of Perdita. Raymond had ev evidently vacillated during his journey, and his, and his irresolution was marked irresolution was marked in every gesture as we entered Perdita's cottage. I watched him curiously, and determined that if the hesitation should continue, I would assist Perdita to overcome herself and teach her to disdain the wavering love of him, who balanced between the possession of a crown and of her whose excellence and affection transcended the worth of a kingdom. Hey, uh, Crethian is also streaming. We may have to go say hi to him if uh, Loriana is still not live. Either way, uh, we found her in her flower-adorned alcove. She was reading the newspaper report of the debate in Parliament that apparently doomed her to hopelessness. That heart-sinking feeling was painted in her sunken eyes and spiritless attitude. A cloud was on her beauty, and frequent sighs were tokens of her distress. This sight had an instantaneous effect on Raymond. His eyes beamed with tenderness, and remorse clothed his manners with earnestness and truth. He sat beside her, and taking the paper from her hand, said, Not a word more will my sweet pretty to read of this contention of madmen and fools. I must not permit you to be acquainted with the extent of my delusion. I must not permit you to be... Acquainted with the extent of my delusion, lest you despise me, although, believe me, I wish to appear before you not vanquished, but as a conqueror, inspired me during my wordy war. Perdita looked at him like one amazed. Her expressive countenance shone for a moment with tenderness. To see him only was happiness. But a bitter thought swiftly shadowed her joy. She bent her eyes on the ground, endeavoring to master the passion of tears that threatened to overwhelm her. Raymond continued. I will, not act, I will not act a part with you, dear girl, or appear other than what I am, weak and unworthy, more fit to excite your disdain than your love. And yet you do love me. I feel and know that you do, and thence I draw my most cherished hopes. If pride guided you, or even reason, you might well reject me. Do so if your high heart, incapable of my infirmity of purpose, refuses to bend to the lowness of mine. Turn from me if you will. If you can, if your whole soul does not urge you to forgive me, if your entire heart does not open wide its door to admit me to its very center, forsake me, never speak to me again. I, though sinning against you almost beyond remission, I am also proud. There must be no reserve in your part, no drawback to the gift of your affection. Perdita looked down, confused, yet pleased. My presence embarrassed her that so, when she dared not meet her lover's eye or trust her voice to assure him of her affections, while well, a blush mantled her cheek and the disconsolate air was exchanged for one expressive of deep-felt joy. Raymond encircled her waist with his arm and continued, I do not... I do not deny that I have bounced between you and the highest hope that mortal men can entertain. But I do so no longer. Take me, mold me to your will, possess me in your heart and soul to all eternity. If you refuse to contribute to my happiness, I quit England tonight and will never set foot in it again. Lionel, you hear? Oh, 
Yeah, it's still the same way, so that is right. Lionel, you here? Witness for me. Persuade your sister to forgive the injury I've done her. Persuade her to be mine. See, that time I knew the yawn was coming, so I took a drink of water and then yawned. <laughs> there needs no persuasion, said the blushing Perdita, except your own dear promises in my ready heart, which whispers to me that they are all true. That same evening we all three walked together in the forest, and with the garrulity which, in, which happiness inspires, they detailed to me the history of their love. It was pleasant to see the haughty Raymond and reserved Perdita changed through happy love into pl prattling, playful children, both losing their characteristic dignity in the fullness of mutual contentment. A night or two ago, Lord Raymond, with a brow of care and a heart oppressed with thought, bent all his energies to silence or persuade the legislators of England that a scepter was not too weighty for his hand, while visions of dominion, war, and triumph floated before him. Now, frolicsome as a lively boy, sporting under his mother's approving eye, the hopes of his ambition were complete, when he pressed the small fair hand of Perdita to his lips, while she, radiant with delight, looked on the still pool, not truly admiring herself, but drinking in with rapture the reflection there, made of the form of herself and her lover, shown for the first time in dear conjunction. I rambled away from them. If the rapture of assured sympathy was theirs, I enjoyed that of restored hope. I looked on the regal towers of Windsor. High is the wall and strong the barrier that rep that. Uh, oh, I lost my point. High is the wall and strong the barrier that separate me from my star of beauty, but not impassable. She will not be his. A few more years dwell in thy native garden, sweet flower. Till by I toil in time, acquire a right to gather thee. Despair not, nor bid me despair. What must I do now? First I must seek Adrian and restore him to her. Patience, gentleness, and untired affection shall recall him if it be true, as Raymond says, that he is mad. Energy and courage shall rescue him if he be unjustly imprisoned. After the lovers again joined me, we supped together in the alcove. Truly it was a fairy supper, for though the air was perfumed by the scent of fruits and wine, we neither, we, we none of us either ate or drank. Even the beauty of the night was unobserved. Their ecstasy could not be increased by outward objects, and I was wrapped in reverie. At about midnight, Raymond and I took leave of my sister to return to town. He was all gaiety. Scraps of songs fell from his lips, every thought of his mind, every object about us, gleamed under the sunshine of his mirth. He accused me of melancholy, of ill humor, and of envy. Not so, said I, though I confess that my thoughts are not occupied as pleasantly as yours are. You promised to return to facilitate my visit to Adrian. I conjure you to perform your promise. I cannot linger here. I long to soothe, perhaps cure the malady of my first and best friend. I shall immediately up depart for Dunkeld. Thou bird of night, what an eclipse do you throw across my bright thoughts, forcing me to call to mind that melancholy ruin which stands in mental desola desolation, more irreparable than a fragment of a carved column in a weed-grown field. You dream that you can restore him? Daedalus never wound so inextricable an error round the Minotaur, as madness has ever woven about his imp imprisoned reason. 
nor you nor any other Theseus can thread the labyrinth to which perhaps some unkind Ad Ad Adrian Adriani? Wait, no. Ari Ariadne? I've never heard this. I have read this name in text. Ariadna? Ariadna. We're gonna we're gonna go with that. Uh, I I have read this name in text many many times, but I've never actually heard it spoken aloud. So we're gonna go with Ariadna. You you allude to Vadna. You you allude to Vadna Zemi, but she's not in England. And were she, I would not advise her seeing him. Better to decay in absolute delirium than to be the victim of a methodical reason of ill-bestowed love. The long duration of his malady has probably erased from his mind all vestige of her, and it were well that it should never again be imprinted. You'll find him at Dunkeld. Gentle and tractable, he wanders up the hills and through the wood, or sits listening beside the waterfall. You may see him, his hair struck with wild flowers, his eyes full of untraceable meaning. His, vo his voice broken, his person wasted to a shadow. He plucks flowers and weeds and weaves chaplets of them, or sails yellow leaves and bits of bark on the stream, rejoicing in their safety or weeping at their wreck. The very memory half unmans me. By, the, by heaven, the first tears I've shed since boyhood rushed scalding into my eyes when I saw him. It needed not this last account to spur me on to visit him. What? Is there not a chapter boundary there? That was cut like it was a chapter boundary. Okay. It needed not this last account to spur me on to visit him. I only doubted whether or not I should endeavor to see Idris again before I departed. This doubt was decided on the following day. Early in the morning, Raymond came to me. Intelligence had arrived that Adrian was dangerously ill, and it appeared impossible that his failing strength could surmount the disorder. Tomorrow, said Raymond, his mother and sister set out for Scotland to see him once again. And I go today. This very hour I'll engage a sailing balloon. I shall be there in forty-eight hours at the furthest, uh, perhaps in less if the wind is fair. Farewell, Raymond. Be happy in having chosen the better part of life. This turn of fortune revives me. I fear madness, not sickness. I have a presentiment that Adrian will not die. Perhaps this illness is a crisis, and he may recover. Everything favored my journey. The balloon rose about half a mile from the earth, and with a favorable wind it hurried through the air, its feathered veins cleaving the unopposing atmosphere. Notwithstanding the melancholy object of my journey, my spirits were exhilarated by reviving hope. Uh, my, spirits, my spirits were exhilarated by reviving hope, by the swift motion of the airy pinnace, and the balmy visitation of the summer air. The pilot hardly moved the plumed steerage, and the slender mechanism of the wings, wide unfurled, gave forth a murmuring noise that was soothing to the senses. Plain and hill, stream and cornfield were discernible below, while the unimpeded sped on swift and secure as a wild swan in his springtime flight. The machine obeyed the slightest motion of the helm, and the wind blowing steadily, there was no let or obstacle to our course. Such was the power of man over the elements, a power long sought and lately won, yet foretold in bygone time by the prince of poets whose verses I quoted much to the astonishment of my pilot when I told him how many hundreds of years ago they had been written. O oh, human wit! Thou canst invent such ill, thou searchest strange arts. Who would think by skill a heavy man should like a light bird stray, and through the empty heavens find a way? I alighted at Perth, and though much fatigued by a constant exposure to the air for many hours, I would not rest, but merely altered my mode of conveyance. I went by land instead of air to Dunkeld. The sun was rising as I entered the opening of the hills. After the revolution of ages, Burnham Hill was again covered with a young forest, while more aged pines, planted at the very commencement of the 19th century by the then Duke of Athol, gave solemnity and beauty to the scene. 
the rising sun first tinged the pine tops, and my mind, rendered through my mountain education deeply susceptible of the graces of nature, and now on the eve of again beholding my beloved and perhaps dying friend, was strangely influenced by the thought of those different beams. Surely they were ominous, and as such I regarded them good omens for Adrian, on whose life my happiness depended. Poor fellow! He lay stretched on a bed of sickness, his cheeks glowing with the hues of fever, his eyes half closed, his breath irregular and difficult. And yet it was less painful to see him thus than to find him f fulfilling the animal functions inter uninterruptedly, his mind sick the while. I established myself at his bedside. I never quitted it day or night. Bitter task was it to behold his spirit waver between life and death, to see his warm cheek and know that the very fire which burned too fiercely there was consuming the vital flute vital fuel, to hear his groaning voice which might never again articulate words of love and wisdom, to witness the ineffectual notions, the ineffectual motions of his limbs, rather, soon be wrapped in their mortal shroud. Such for three days and nights appeared the consummation which fate had decreed for my labors, and I became haggard and spectral-like, spectre-like, though through anxiety and watching. At length his eyes unclosed faintly, yet with a look of returning life he became pale and weak. But the rigidity of his features was softened by approaching convalescence. He knew me. What a brimful cup of joyous, joyful agony it was when his face first gleamed with the, with the glance of recognition, when he pressed my hand now more fevered than his own, and when he pronounced my name. No trace of his past insanity remained to dash my joy with sorrow. The same evening, his mother and sister arrived. The Countess of Windsor was by nature full of energetic feeling, but she had very, se but she had very seldom in her life permitted the concentrated emotions of her heart to show themselves on her feature. The studied immovability of her countenance, her slow, equable manner, and soft but unmelodious voice were a mask hiding her her fiery passions and the impatience of her disposition she did not in the least resemble either of her children her black and sparkling eye lit up by pride was totally unlike the blue luster and frank benign expression of either adrian or idris there was something grand and majestic in her motions but nothing persuasive nothing amiable tall thin and straight her face still handsome, her raven hair hardly tinged with gray, her forehead arched and beautiful, had not the eyebrows been somewhat scattered, it was not supposed to be, it was impossible not to be struck by her, almost to fear her. Idris appeared to be the only being who could resist her mother, notwithstanding the extreme mildness of her character. But there was a fearlessness and frankness about her, which said that she would not encroach on her mother's liberty, but held her own sacred, but held her own sacred and unassailable. Okay, folks, I know we're not near a chapter boundary, but we've been uh, reading for about an hour, probably. Uh, so I'm going to mute the mic. Uh, I'm going to get up, stretch, maybe grab some water, maybe grab some food if you all need it. Now is the perfect time for a break. We will be right back uh, with more The Last Man soon enough.
Okay. Oh, wrong scene. There we go. Ooh. I tried to get all my yawns out. I had myself a little drink of water. Uh, if you... Uh, one thing I forgot to mention before... Oh, come on. <laughs> Sorry, the layout likes to do this sometimes, where it just decides to have scroll bars, even though it really shouldn't. Uh... Yeah, I'm not sure why it does that, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I'll have to yutz with it after stream. Anyway, uh, one thing I've got to mention is if you've been sitting the whole time uh, we've been reading here, uh, it would be it would have been a good time to get up and stretch your legs. Uh, you know, it's, it's not good to sit continuously for too long. Uh, oh, I forget you all can hear this buzzing noise. Let me fix that. Sorry, I just I I uh, I don't particularly want to edit that out of the podcast recording. Oh, where were we? Where were we? That's a good question. Ah, something grand and majestic in her notion in her motions, but nothing persuasive, nothing amiable. Tall, thin, and straight, her face still handsome, her raven hair hardly tinged with gray, her forehead arched and beautiful, had not the eyebrows been somewhat scattered, it was impossible not to be struck by her, almost to fear her. Idris appeared to be the only being who could resist her mother, notwithstanding the extreme mildness of her character. But there was a fearlessness and frankness about her, which said she would not encroach on another's liberty, but held her own sacred and unassailable. The Countess cast no look of kindness on my worn-out frame, though afterwards she thanked me coldly for my attentions. Not so Idris. Her, fir her first glance was for her brother. She took his hand, she kissed his eyelids, and hung over him with looks of compassion and love. Her eyes glistened with tears when she thanked me, and the grace of her expressions was enhanced, not diminished by the fervor, which caused her almost to falter as she spoke. Her mother... All eyes and ears soon interrupted us, and I saw that she wished to dismiss me quietly, as one whose services, now that his relatives had arrived, were of no use to her son. I was harassed and ill, resolved not to give up my post, yet doubting in what way should I, should I assert it, when Adrian called me and, clasping my hand, bade me not leave him. His mother, apparently inattentive, had at once understood what was meant, and seeing the hold we had upon her yielded the point to us. The days that followed were full of pain to me, so that I sometimes regretted that I had not yielded at once to the haughty lady who watched all, who watched all my motions, and turned my beloved task of nursing my friend to a work of pain and irritation. Never did anyone, any woman appear entirely so made of mind as the Countess of Windsor, her passions had subdued her appetites, even her natural wants. She slept little, and hardly ate at all. Her body was evidently considered by her as a mere machine whose health was necessary for the accomplishment of her schemes, but whose senses formed no part of her enjoyment. There is something fearful in one who can conquer the animal part of our nature, if the victory be not the effect of consummate virtue. Nor was it without a mixture of this feeling that I beheld the figure of the Countess, awake when others slept, fasting when I abstemious naturally, naturally, and rendered so by the fever that preyed on me was forced to recruit myself with food. She resolved to prevent or diminish my opportunities of acquiring influence over her children, and circumvented my plans by a hard, quiet, stubborn resolution. It seemed not to belong to flesh and blood. War was at last tacitly acknowledged between us. We had had many pitched battles, during which no word was spoken, hardly a look was interchanged, but in which each resolved not to submit to the other. The Countess had the advantage of position, so I was vanquished, though I would not yield. I became sick at heart. My countenance was painted with the hues of ill health and vexation. Adrian and, I Adrian and Idris saw this. They attributed it to my long watching and anxiety. They urged me to rest and take care of myself while I most truly assured them that my best medicine was their good wishes, those in the assured convalescence of my friend, now daily more apparent. The faint rose again blushed on his cheek. His brow and lips lost the ashy paleness of threatened dissolution. Such was the dear reward of my unremitting attention, 
and its bounteous he and bounteous heaven added overflowing recompense, when it gave me also the thanks and smiles of Idris. After the lapse of a few weeks, we left Dunkeld. Idris and her mother returned immediately to Windsor, while Adrian and I followed by slow journeys and frequent stoppages, occasioned by his continued weakness. As we traversed the various little counties of England, all wore an exhilarating appearance to my companion, who had been so long secluded by his disease from the enjoyments of weather and scenery. We passed through busy towns and cultivated plains. The husbandmen were getting in their piteous, plenteous harvests, and the women and children, often occupied by light rustic toils, formed groups of happy, healthful persons, the very sight of whom ch carried cheerfulness to the heart. One evening, quitting our inn, we strolled down a shady lane, then up a grassy slope till we came to an eminence that commanded an extensive view of hill and dale, meandering rivers, dark clouds, and shining villages. The sun was setting, and the clouds straying like new-shorn sheep through the vast fields of sky, received the golden color of his parting beams. The distant uplands shone out, and the busy hum of evening came, harmonized by distance on our ear. Adrian, who felt all the fresh spirit infused by returning health, clasped his hands in delight and exclaimed with transport, O oh, happy earth, and O oh, happy inhabitants of earth, a stately palace has God built for you, O oh man, and worthy of you are of your dwelling. Behold the verdant carpet spread at our feet, and the azure canopy above, the fields of earth which generate and nurture all things, and the track of heaven which contains and clasps all things. Now at this evening hour, at the period of repose and reflection, methinks all hearts breathe one hymn of love and thanksgiving, and we, like priests of old on the mountain tops, give a voice to their sentiment. Assuredly a most benign power built up the majestic fabric we inhabit, and framed by the laws which it endures. If mere existence and not happiness had been the final end of our being, what need of the profuse luxuries which we enjoy? Why should our dwelling place be so lovely, and why should the instincts of nature minister pleasurable sensations? The very sustaining of our animal machine is made delightful, and our sustenance, the fruits of the field, is painted with transcendent hues, endued with grateful odors, and palatable to our taste. Why should this be if he were not good? If we need houses to protect us from the seasons and behold the materials which with, with which we are provided, the growth of trees with their adornment of leaves, while rocks of stone piled above the plains variegate the prospect with their pleasant irregularity. Nor are outward objects alone the receptacles of the spirit of good. Look into the mind of man where wisdom reigns enthroned, where imagination, the painter, sits, with his pencil dipped in hues lovelier than those of a sunset, adorning familiar life with glowing tints. What a noble boon worthy the giver is the imagination! It takes from reality its leaden hue, it envelops all thought and sensation in a radiant veil, and with a land of beauty, with a hand of beauty, beckons us from the sterile seas of life to her gardens and bowers and glades of bliss. And is not love a gift from the divinity? Love and her child hope, which can bestow wealth on poverty, strength on the weak, and happiness on the sorrowing. My lot has not been fortunate. I have consorted long with grief, entered the gloomy labyrinth of madness, and emerged but half alive. And yet I thank God that I have lived, I thank God that I have beheld his throne, the heavens and earth, his footstool. I am glad that I have seen the changes of his day, to behold the sun, fountain of light, and gentle pilgrim moon, to have seen the fire-bearing flowers of the sky, and the flowery stars of the earth, to have witnessed the sowing and the harvest. I am glad that I have loved and have experienced sympathetic joy and sorrow with my fellow creatures. I am glad now to feel the current of thought flow through my mind, as the blood through articulations of my frame, mere existence is pleasure, and I thank God that I live. Also, it's Magnus. He's decided to see what we're on about. Thank you for joining us, Magnus. you have anything to say? No. He just wants love. And all ye happy nurslings of Mother Earth, do ye not echo my words? Ye who are linked by the affectionate ties of nature, companions, friends, lovers, fathers who toil with joy for their offspring, women who, while gazing on the living forms of their children, forget the pains of maternity, children who neither cho toil nor spin, but, are lo but love and are loved. 
Oh, that death and sickness were banished from our earthly home, that hatred, tyranny, and fear could no longer make their lair in the human heart, that each man might find a brother in his fellow, and a nest of tropes, a nest of repose amid the wide plains of inheritance, that the source of tears were dry, and that the lips might no longer form the expressions of sorrow, sleeping thus under the beneficent eye of heaven, can evil visit thee, O earth, or grief cradle to thy graves, thy luckless children? Whisper it not, let the demons hear and rejoice. The choice is with us, let us will it, and our habitation becomes a paradise. For the will of man is omnipotent. Uh, oh, I lost my place. Where was I? Will of man is omnipotent. Blunting the arrows. Blunting the arrows of death, soothing the bed of disease, and wiping away the tears of agony. And what is each human being worth if he do not put forth his strength to aid his fellow creature? My soul is a fading spark, my nature frail as a spent wave, but I dedicate all of that intellect and strength that remains to me to that one work, and take me upon the task, as far as I am able, of bestowing blessings on my fellow men. His voice trembled, his eyes were cast upward, his hands clasped, and his fragile person was bent, as it were, with the excess of emotion. The spirit of life seemed to linger in his form. A dying flame on an altar flickers on the ember of an accepted sacrifice. This is chapter 6, despite being mislabeled as chapter 5, because we had two chapter 4s for some reason. I assume that's just going to carry forward that all the chapter numbers are one-off. Uh... But that's if you're just just if you're reading along. If you're just listening, I'll have I'll have the right chapter numbers for you. Chapter six. When we arrived at Windsor, I found that Raymond and Perdita had departed for the continent. I took possession of my sister's cottage and blessed myself that I lived within view of Windsor Castle. It was a curious fact at this period, when by the marriage of Perdita I was allied to one of the richest individuals in England, and was bound by the most intimate friendship to its chiefest noble, I experienced the greatest excess of poverty that I had ever known. My knowledge of the worldly principles of Lord Raymond would have ever prevented me from applying to him, however deep my distress might have been. It was in vain that I repeated to myself, with regard to Adrian, that his purse was open to me, that one in soul as we were, our fortunes also ought to be common. I could never a while with him think of his bounty as a remedy to my poverty, I even put aside hastily his offers of supplies, assuring him of a falsehood that I needed them not. How could I say to this generous being, Maintain me in your idleness? You have dedicated your powers of mind and fortune to the benefit of your species. Shall you so dis misdirect your exertions as to support the uselessness of the strong, healthy, and capable? And yet I dared not request him to use his influence that I might obtain an honorable provision for myself, for that I should have been obliged to leave Windsor. I hovered forever th around the walls of its castle, beneath its enshadowing thickets. My sole companions were my books and my loving thoughts. I studied the wisdom of the ancients and gazed on the happy walls that sheltered the beloved of my soul. My mind was nevertheless idle. I pored over the poetry of old times, I studied the metaphysics of Plato and Berkeley, I read the histories of Greece and Rome and of England's former periods, and I watched the movements of the lady of my heart. At night I could see her shadow on the walls of her apartment. By day I viewed her in her flower garden, or riding in the park with her usual companions. Methought the charm would be broken if I were seen, but I heard the music of her voice and was happy. I gave to each heroine of whom I read her beauty and matchless excellences. Such was Antigone. When she... Antigone? I've never seen it spelled like that. That's probably why I'm saying it wrong. When she guided the blind Oedipus to the grove of the Eumendes and discharged the funeral rites of Polynesus. Such was Miranda in the un unvisited cave of Prospero. Such Haiti on the sands of the Ionian island. I was mad with excess of passionate devotion, but pride, tameless as fire, invested my nature, and prevented me from betraying myself by word or look. In the, t in the meantime, while I thus pampered myself with rich mental repasts, a peasant would have disdained my scanty fare, which I sometimes robbed from the squirrels of the forest. I was, I own, often tempted to recur to the lawless feats of my boyhood, 
and knocked down the almost tame pheasants that perched upon the trees and bent their bright eyes on me. But they were the property of Adrian, the nurslings of Idris, and so, although my imagination re rendered sensual by privation, made me think that they would better become the spit in my kitchen than the green leaves of the forest. Nonetheless, I checked my haughty will and did not eat, but supped upon sentiment, and dreamt vainly of such morsels sweet as I might not awaking attain. But at this period the whole scheme of my existence was about to change. The orphan and neglected son of Verney was on the eve of being linked to the mechanism of society by a golden chain, and to enter into all the duties and affections of life. Miracles were to be wrought in my favor, the machine of social life pushed with a vast effort backward. Attend, O oh reader, while I narrate this tale of wonders. That'd be a good intro every week. Attend, O oh reader, while I narrate this tale of wonders. I might actually keep that. I was joking, but I might keep that. One day, as Adrian and Idris were riding through the forest with their mother and accustomed companions, Idris, drawing her brother aside from the rest of the cavalcade, suddenly asked him, What had become of his friend, Lionel Verney? Even from the spot, replied Adrian, pointing to my sister's cottage, you can see his dwelling. Indeed, and why, if he be so near, does he not come to see us and make one of our society? I often visit him, but you may easily guess the motives, which prevent him from coming where his presence may annoy any one among us. I do guess them, and such as they are, I would not venture to combat them. Tell me, however, in what way he passes his time. What is he doing and thinking in his cottage retreat? Nay, my sweet sister, you ask me more than I can well answer. But if you feel interest in him, why not visit him? He will feel highly honored, and thus you may repay a part of the obligation I owe him, and compensate for the injuries fortune has done him. Oh, sorry, my cats have opinions. What's the problem, boys? Nothing? You guys just talking? Okay. I will most readily accompany you to his abode, said the lady. Not that I wish that either of us should unburthen ourselves of our debt, which being no less than your life must remain unpayable ever. But let us go. Tomorrow we will arrange to ride out together, and proceeding toward that part of the forest, call upon him. The next evening, therefore, though the autumnal change had brought on cold and rain, Adrian and Idris had entered my cottage. They found me, curious-like, feasting on sorry fruits for supper, but they brought gifts richer than the golden bribes of the Sabines, nor could I refuse the invaluable store of friendship and delight which they bestowed. Surely the glorious twins of Latona were not more welcome when, in the infancy of the world, they were brought forth to beautify and enlighten this sterile promontory, than were this angel, were, than were this angelic pair, to my lowly dwelling and grateful heart. We sat like one family around my heart. Our talk was on subjects unconnected with the emotions that evidently occupied each. But we each divined the other's thought, and as our voices spoke of indifferent matters, our eyes, in mute language, told a thousand things no tongue could have uttered. They left me in an hour's time. They left me happy. How unspeakably happy. It did not require the measured sounds of human language to syllable the story of my ecstasy. Idris had visited me. Idris I should see again and again. My imagination did not wander beyond the completeness of this knowledge. I trod air, no doubt. No fear, no hope even disturbed me. I clasped with my soul the fullness of contentment, satisfied, undesiring, beatified. For many days, Adrian and Idris continued to visit me thus. In this dear intercourse, love, in the guise of enthusiastic friendship, infused more and more of his om omnipotent spirit. Idris felt it. Yes, divinity of the world, I read your characters in her looks and gesture. I heard your melodious voice echoed by her. You prepared for us a soft and flowery path. All gentle thoughts adorned it. Your name, O oh love, was not spoken, but you stood genius of the hour, veiled in time, but no mortal hand might raise the curtain. Organs of articulate sound did not proclaim the union of our hearts, for untoward circumstance allowed no opportunity for the expression that was hovered on our lips. O oh, my pen, haste thou to write what was before the thought of what is arrest the hands that guide thee. If I lift up my eyes and see the desert earth, and see that the, and feel that those dear eyes have spent their mortal luster, 
and that those beauteous lips are silent, their crimson leaves faded, forever I am mute. But you live, my Idris, even now you move before me. There was a glado reader, a grassy opening in the wood, the retiring trees left its velvet expanse as a temple for love. The silver Thames bounded on one side, and a willow bending down dipped in the water its naiad hair, disheveled by the wind's viewless hand. The oaks around were the home of a tribe of nightingales. There I am now, Idris in youth's dear prime is by my side. Remember, I am just twenty-two, and seventeen summers have scarcely passed over the beloved of my heart. The river, swollen by autumnal rains, deluged the lowlands, and Adrian, in his favorite boat, is employed in the dangerous pastime of plucking the topmost bough from a submerged oak. Are you weary of life, O Adrian, that you thus play with danger? He obtained his prize and pilots his boat through the flood. Our eyes were fixed on him fearfully, but the stream carried him away from us. He was forced to land far lower down and to make a considerable circuit before he could join us. He's safe, said Idris, as he leapt on shore and waved the bow over his head in token of success. We will wait for him here. And so we were alone together. The sun had set. The song of the nightingales began. The evening star shone distinct in the flood of light, which, has, which had yet to fade in the west. The blue eyes of my angelic girl were fixated on this sweet emblem of herself. How the light palpitates, which is that star's light. Its vacillating effulgence seems to say that its state, even like ours upon earth, is wavering and inconstant. It fears, methinks, and it loves. Gaze not on the star, dear generous friend. Read not its love in its trembling rays. Look not upon distant worlds. Speak not of the mere imagination of a sentiment. I have long been silent. Long even to sickness have I desired to speak to you and submit my soul, my life, my entire being to you. Look not on the star, dear love, or do, and let that eternal spark plead for me. Let it be my witness and my advocate, silent as it shines. Love is to me as, as his light to the star, even so long as it's uneclipsed by annihilation, so long shall I love you. Veiled forever the world's callous eye must be the transport of that moment. Still do I feel her graceful form press against my full fraught heart. Still does sight and pulse and breath sicken and fail at the remembrance of that first kiss. Slowly and silently, when we, meant to, when we met to meet Adrian, whom we heard approaching. I entreated Adrian to return to me after he'd conducted his sister home, and that same evening, walking among the moonlit forest paths, I poured forth my whole heart, its transport and its hope to my friend. For a moment he looked disturbed. I might have foreseen this. What strife will now ensue? Pardon me, Lionel. Uh, nor wonder what the expectation of contest with my mother should jar me, when else I should delightedly confess that my best hopes are fulfilled in confiding your sis my sister to your protection. If you don't already know it, you shall l soon learn the deep hate my mother bears to the name Verney. I will converse with Idris, then all that a, man a friend can do I will do. To her it must belong to play the lover's part, if she be capable of it. While the brother and sister were still hesitating in what manner they could best attempt to bring their mother over to the party, she, suspecting our meetings, taxed her children with them, taxed her fair daughter with deceit and an unbecoming attachment for one whose only merit was being the son of the profligate favorite of her impudent father, and who was doubtless as worthless as he from whom he boasted his descent. The eyes of Idris flashed at this accusation. She replied, I do not die I do not deny that I love Verney. Prove to me that he's worthless, and I will see him never more. Dear madam, let me entreat you to see him to cultivate his friendship. You will wonder then, as I do, at the extent of his accomplishments and the brilliancy of his talents. Pardon me, gentle reader, this is not feudal vanity, not feudal, since to know that Adrian felt this thus brings joy now, even to my lone heart. Mad and foolish boy, you've chosen with your dreams and theories to overthrow my schemes for your own aggrandizement, but you shall not do the same by those who are for those I have formed for your sister. I but too well understand the fascination you both labor under, since I had the same struggle with your father to make him cast off the parent of his youth, who hid his evil prop propensities with the smoothness and subtlety of a viper. 
In those days, how often did I hear of his attraction, his widespread conquest, his wit, his refined manners? It's well when flies are only caught by such flighter's web. But is it for the high-born and powerful to bow their necks to the flimsy yoke of these unmeaning pretensions? Were your sister indeed the significant, insignificant person she deserves to be, I'd willingly leave her to the fate, the wretched fate, of the wife of his man, whom's very person, resembling as it does his wretched father, ought to remind you of the folly and vice it typifies. But remember, Lady Idris, it is not alone the once royal blood of England that colors your veins. You are princess of Austria, and every life drop is akin to emperors and kings. Are you then a fit mate for an uneducated shepherd boy whose only inheritance is his father's tarnished name? I can make but one defense, replied Idris, the same offered by my brother. See, Lionel, cur converse with my shepherd boy. The countess interrupted her indignantly. Yours! she cried, and then smoothing her impassioned features to a disdainful smile, she continued, We will talk of this another time. All I now ask, all your mother Idris requests, is that you will not see this upstart during the interval of one month. I dare not comply. It would pain him too much. I have no right to play with his feelings, to accept his proffered love, and then sting him with neglect. This is going too far, her mother answered, with quivering lips, and eyes again instinct by answer. Nay, madam, unless my sister consent never to see him again, it is surely a useless torment to separate them for a month, said Adrian. Certainly, replied the ex-queen with bitter scorn, his love and her love and both their childish flutterings are to be put in fit comparison with my years of hoping and anxiety, with the, du with the duties of an offspring of kings, with a high and dignified conduct, with which one of her descent ought to pursue. But is it unworthy of me to argue and complain? Perhaps you have the goodness to promise me not to marry during that interval. This was asked only half ironically, and Idris wondered why her mother should extort from her a solemn vow not to do what she'd never dreamed of doing. But the promise was required and given. All went on cheerfully now. We talked, and without dread of our future plans. The Countess was so gentle, and even beyond her want amiable with her children, that they began to entertain hopes of her ultimate consent. She was too unlike them, too utterly alien to their tastes, for them to find delight in her society or in the prospect of its continuance, but it gave them pleasure to see her consolating and kind. Once, even, Adrian ventured to propose her receiving me. She refused with a smile, reminding him that for the present his sister had promised to be patient. One day, after the lapse of nearly a month, Adrian received a letter from a friend in London requesting his immediate presence for the furtherance of some important object. Guileless himself, Adrian, feared, Adrian feared no deceit. I rode with him as far as Staines. He was in high spirits, and since I could not see Idris during his absence, he promised a speedy return. His gaiety, which, ex which was extreme, had the strange effect of awaking in me contrary feelings. A presentment of evil hung over me. I loitered on my return. I counted the hours that must elapse before I saw Idris again. Wherefore should this be? What evil might not happen in the meantime? Might not her mother take advantage of Adrian's absence to urge her beyond her sufferings? Perhaps to entrap her? I resolved, let what would befall, to see and converse with her the following day. This determination soothed me. Tomorrow, loveliest and best, hope and joy of my life, tomorrow I will see thee, fool to a dream of moment's delay. I went to rest. At past midnight I was awakened by a violent knocking. And it was now deep winter. It had snowed and was still snowing. The wind whistled in the leafless trees, despoiling them of the white flakes as they fell. Its drear moaning and the continued knocking mingled wildly with my dreams. At length I was wide awake, hastily dressing myself, and I hurried to cover, discover this cause of this disturbance, and to open my door to the unexpected visitor. Pale as the snow that showered about her, with clasped hands, Idris stood before me. Save me! she exclaimed, and would have sunk to the ground had I not supported her. In a moment, however, she revived, and with energy almost, with violence, entreated me to saddle horses, to take her away, away to London, to her brother at least, to save her. 
I had no horses, and she wrung her hand. What can I do? I'm lost. We are both forever lost. C come with me, Lionel. Here I must not stay. We can get a chase at the nearest post house. Uh, perhaps we have time. Uh, come with me to save and protect me. And when I heard her piteous demands, while with disordered dress, disheveled hair, and aghast looks, she wrung her hands. The idea shot across me. Was she also mad? Sweet one, I and I folded her to my heart. Better repose than wander further. Rest, my beloved. I'll make you a fire. You're chill. Rest, she cried. Repose! You rave, Lionel. If you delay, we're lost. Come, I pray you, unless you'd cast me off forever. That Idris, the princely born, nursling of wealth and luxury, should have come through the tempestuous winter night from a regal abode, and standing at my lowly door, conjure me to fly with her through darkness and storm, was surely a dream. Again, her plaintive tones, the sight of her loveliness, assured me that it was no vision. Looking timidly around, as if she feared to be overheard, I, she whispered, I've discovered, tomorrow, that is today, already the tomorrow has come, before dawn, foreigners, Austrians, my mother's hirelings, are to carry me off to Germany, to prison, to marriage, to anything except you and my brother. Take me away, or soon they'll be here. I was frightened by her violence, and imagined some mistake in her incoherent tale, but I no longer hesitated to obey. She had come by herself from the castle three long miles at midnight through a heavy snow. We must reach Engelfeld Green a mile and a half further before we could obtain a chase. She told me that she'd kept up her strength and courage till her arrival at my cottage, and then both failed. Now she could hardly walk. Supporting her as I did, she still lagged, and at the distance of half a mile, after many stoppages, shivering fits, and half faintings, she slipped from my supporting arm on the snow, and with a torrent of tears averred that she must be taken, for she could not proceed. I lifted her up in my arms, and her light form rested on my breast. I felt no burden except the internal one of contrary and contending emotions. Brimming delight now invested me. Again her chill limbs touched me as a torpedo, and I shuddered in sympathy with pain and fright. Her head lay on my shoulder, her breath waved my hair, her heart beat near mine. Transport made me tremble, blinded me, annihilated me, till the suppressed groan bursting from her lips, the chattering of her teeth, which she strove vainly to subdue, and all the signs of suffering she evinced, recalled me to the necessity of speed and succor. At last I said to her, There is Engelfeld Green, and there is the inn, but if you are seen thus strangely circumstanced, dear Idris, even now your enemies may learn of your flight too soon. Were it not better that I hire the chase alone? I'll put you in safety meanwhile, and return you immediately. She answered that I was right, and might do with her as I pleased. I observed the door of a small outhouse ajar. I pushed it open with some hay strewn about. I formed a couch for her, placing her exhausted frame on it, and covering her with my cloak. I feared to leave her, she looked so wan and faint, but in a moment she required animation, reacquired animation, rather, and with that fear, and again she implored me not to delay to call up the people of the inn and to obtain a conveyance and horses, even though I harnessed them myself, was the work of many minutes, minutes each frightened with the weight of ages. I caused the chase to advance a little, waited till the people of the inn had retired, and then made the postboy draw up the carriage to the spot where Idris, impatient and now somewhat recovered, stood waiting for me. I lifted her into the chaise. I assured her with our four horses that we should arrive in London before five o'clock, the hour when she should be sought and missed. I besought her to calm herself. A kindly shower of tears relieved her, and by degrees she related her tale of fear and peril. That same night, after Adrian's departure, her mother had warmly expostulated with her on the subject of her attachment to me. Every motive, every threat, every angry taunt was urged in vain. She seemed to consider that through me she had lost Raymond. I was the evil influence of her life. I was even in accused of increasing and confirming the mad and based apostasy. I was even accused of increasing and confirming the mad and based apost apostasy? Yeah, apostasy. <laughs> Why couldn't I read that the first time? I was even accused of increasing and confirming the mad and based apost apostasy of Adrian from all views of advancement and grandeur 
and now this miserable mountaineer was to steal her daughter. Never, Idris related, did the angry lady deign to recur to gentleness and persuasion. If she had, the task of resistance would have been exquisitely painful. As it was, the sweet girl's generous nature was roused to defend and ally herself with my despised cause. Her mother ended with a look of co co contempt and covert triumph, which for a moment awakened the suspicions of Idris. When they parted for the night, the countess said, "'Tomorrow I trust your tone will be changed. Be composed, I've agitated you. Go to rest. I will send you a medicine I always take when unduly restless. It'll give you a quiet night.'" By that time, she, with her, un by the by the time that she had uneasy thoughts, laid her fair. <sighs> I was reading it right the first time. By that time, she had, with uneasy thoughts, laid her cheek upon her pillow. Her mother's servant brought a draught. A suspicion again crossed her. This novel proceeding, sufficiently alarming her to determine not to take the potion. But. Dislike of contention and a wish to discover whether there was any just foundation for her conjectures made her, she said, almost instinctively, and ow, Magnus, that's my leg, it's attached to me. <laughs> Sorry. One of my cats occasionally forgets that my body parts are in fact attached to me. Hey, that's my foot, that's also attached to me. You get to be on camera. You get to be on camera for your crimes. He's like, no, Dad, don't let the world see me. <laughs> uh, wish to discover whether there, would, there was any just foundation for her conjectures made her, she said, almost instinctively, and in contradiction to her usual frankness, pretend to swallow the medicine. Then, agitated as she had been by her mother's violence, and now by unaccustomed fears, she lay, unable to sleep, starting at every sound. Soon her door opened softly, and on her springing up she heard a whisper, Not asleep yet. And the door again closed. With a beating heart, she expected another visit. And when, after an interval, her chamber was again invaded, having first assured herself that the intruders were her mother and attendant, she composed herself to feign sleep. A step approached her bed. She dared not move. She strove to calm her palpitations, which became more violent when she heard her mother say, mutteringly, "'Pretty simpleton. Little do you to think that your game is already at an end forever.' For a moment, the poor girl fancied that her mother believed that she drank poison. She was on the point of springing up when the countess, already at a distance from the bed, spoke in a low voice to her companion, and again Idris listened. Hasten! There is no time to lose. It is long past eleven. They will be here at five. Take merely the clothes necessary for her journey and her jewel casket. Agnes? Kitty, we're in the middle of a very dramatic moment. I'd ask you to not bury the food. Oh, well, he did not listen, and so I must pick on him up. He's like, no, don't pick me up. Come here. You know what you did, and now I have to pick you up. You little gerblin. Pick you up and show you to the world. He says, nope, I'm going to hide up there. See, the thing about that kitty cat is I can still reach you there. Oh, I know. Isn't it just the worst when Papa pick you up for your crime? Now I must display his toe beans to the world. He says, Dad, this is miserable. I am miserable. Why do you do this to me? Because you keep burying the food. So, for context. <laughs> nope, nope, you're going to stay right there. Uh, 
For context, Magnus very much enjoys to paw at the food dish as though he is burying it. And because... Oh! I almost fell there. Uh, because the food dish is very precarious, to put it politely, um, <laughs> that has the bad habit of knocking it over, and since it's, uh, you know, auto-feeding, it's supposed to, uh, you know, supposed to continuously provide food. And so library's gotten used to that, so anytime the food disappears for more than uh, an hour or two, he panics, scarfs down his food, and ralphs. And unfortunately, Magnus's digging habit <laughs> makes it such that he, uh, he tends to knock over the food and make library puke. So I'm trying to get him to stop having that digging habit pretty unsuccessfully. If anyone out there has any suggestions, feel free to put them in, uh, you know, reply to something on Twitter I've done, or Discord. Uh, you know, you can even send me an email <laughs> uh, if you really want. I, I'm pretty accessible on the internet. Uh, Anyway, where were we? The jewel casket. There we were. The servant obeyed. Few few words were spoken on either side, but those were caught at. But those that were were caught at, caught at with avidity by the intended victim. She heard the name of her own maid mentioned. No, no, she does not go with us. Lady Idris must forget England and all belonging to it. And again she heard. She will not wake tomorrow, and we shall then be at sea. All is ready. At length the woman announced. The Countess again came to her daughter's bedside. In Austria, at least, you'll obey. In Austria, where obedience can be enforced, and no choice left between an honorable person and a fitting marriage. Magnus, buddy, guy, pal, I'm trying to read. Come here. You gonna come here? He says, I'm thinking about it, but you pick me up. Yeah. You gotta leave the food alone. I gotta finish reading. We got at least, at least, at least to finish this chapter. Uh, both then withdrew, though as she went, the Countess said, Softly I'll sleep, though all have not been prepared for sleep like her. I would not have any one suspect, or she might be roused to resistance, and perhaps escape. Come with me to my room, we will remain there until the hour agreed upon. They went in Idris, panic-struck, but animated and strengthened even by her excessive fear, dressed herself hurriedly, and going down a flight of back stairs, avoiding the vicinity of her mother's apartment, she contrived to escape from the castle by a low window, and came through snow, wind, and obscurity to my cottage. Nor lost her courage until she arrived, and, depositing her fate in my hands, gave herself up to desperation and weariness that overwhelmed her. I comforted her as well as I might. Joy and exultation were mine to possess, and to save her, and yet not to excite fresh agitation in her. Per non tu bar quel, be, per non tu bar quel bel viso sereno, I curbed my delight. I strove to quiet the eager dancing of my heart. I turned from her eyes, beaming with too much tenderness and proudly to the dark night, and the inclement atmosphere murmured the expressions of my transport. We reached London, we thought, all too soon. And yet I could not regret our speedy arrival, and when I witnessed the ecstasy with which my beloved girl found herself in her brother's arms, safe from every evil under his unblamed protection. Adrian wrote a brief note to his mother, informing her that Idris was under his care and guardianship. Several days elapsed, and at last an answer came, dated from Cologne. It was useless, the, haunted, the haughty and disappointed lady wrote, for the Earl of Windsor and his sister to address again the injured parent, whose only expectation of tranquillity must be derived from the oblivion of her their existence. Her desires had been blasted, her schemes overthrown. She did not complain in her brother's court she would find not compensation for their disobedience, filial and kindness admitted of none. But such a state of things and mode of life... Magnus, please, this is very dramatic. I'd ask that you not knock over the food. Uh... Mode of life as might best reconcile her to, to her, uh, reconcile her to her fate. Under such circumstances, she positively declined any communication with them. Such were the strange and incredible events that finally brought about my union with the sister of my best friend, with my adored Idris. 
With simplicity and courage, she set aside the prejudices and opposition which were obstacles to my happiness, nor scrupled to give her hand where she had given her heart, to be worthy of her, to raise myself to her height with devoted un with, through the exertions of talent and virtue, to repay her love with devoted, unwearied tenderness were the only thanks I could offer for the matchless gift. All right, folks. Uh, as much as I want to dive into Chapter 7, Magnus has decided it is real power, it is real problems hour. Yes, you have. You've decided it's just... It's just real problems hour, isn't it, baby? And unfortunately... Due to my ease of distractedness. Meow. 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 Unfortunately, due to my ease of distractedness, I do not feel that I can uh, dive into chapter 7 here. Oh, wait. 5, 6. Yeah, 7. We're one ahead. Uh, I don't feel I can dive into chapter 7 while this one decides that it continues to be real problems hour. Uh, so, I'm going to have to call it a night. Especially because Magnus is trying to stab me in the chest for holding him. Yeah, this is what happens when you dig. You get picked up and you get embarrassed. Live to the whole internet. He's like, don't embarrass me, Dad. Please, my honor. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Let me let go of my shirt. Go on my shirt. Thank you. Let me put you down. Bonk. Alright, folks. Uh, I'm going to call it an evening. Uh, this has been Paper Cuts. And I hope it didn't sting.